is on the economy of the country. You can grab a copy for those riveting stories in our delis this morning. But we are focusing this morning on our economy and of course our biggest chunk of that is the discovery of oil. The National Oil Corporation of Kenya has moved to reassure residents of Kajado that they shall not lose their land. The residents were intent on blocking efforts to prospect for oil in the fear that they shall lose their land. How many are they? They are four. Well represented. Kajado residents have been opposing oil exploration in the area, fearing loss of land. The National Oil Corporation of Kenya, NOC, awarded a Canadian oil prospecting company a tender to explore oil in three blocks covering hundreds of hectares in four group ranches, Old Kiramatian, Shompole, Old Kerry in Magadi location and Old Donyokie. The company has pitched tents ready to hit the ground, but residents claim they are not ready for the exercise. The residents say they are not consulted and some say the money proposed as the compensation to those their land will be affected is too little. But one thing we are saying is that they will not continue MCS, governor, senator. NOC has set aside 422 million shillings to be paid to the displaced persons in the four blocks and an additional 80,000 shillings as ground rent for each of the four camps. We have project However, the leaders say they are not opposed to the project if the right procedures are used. The Canadian company acquired the exploration license in 2010 and they expect to explore an area of 340 line kilometers. The exercise is expected to take a few years to hit the black gold if at all that happens. Kiangalia sehemu za Turkana mafuta alianza kutafutwa 1984 na mapatikana 2012 na kazi imekuwa ikiendelea. Lamu mafuta ilianza kutafutwa in the 50s. In case oil is found in Kajado West, it shall add on to soda ash, wind energy and geothermal energy the area boasts of. Barry Lombani, NTV. Yes, and that's the story that is leading up to our interview this morning. And of course, we can see that happening in Kajado, also in Kisumu. And of course, the new oil and gas discoveries in East Africa and in Kenya's uh, Turkana County have the power to be the drivers of development in the region if managed effectively. However, many potential obstacles that have plagued resource-rich countries before, including weak institutions, inadequate macroeconomics uh, policies, poor management and governance, and lack of profit-sharing mechanisms among the relevant stakeholders, which are the local communities, uh, central government, uh, current and future generations and national and international private sector investors could threaten and even derail effective use of these resources to improve the lives of those in the region and of course we're going to explore this widely this morning and uh, with me this morning is the director of oil and gas kk training institute tell us more about the challenges that we're going to face in this country and how we're going to overcome these harms these harms that are along the way as we you know relish what we have all discovery in this country a very good morning to you bill morning hey, morning good how to see you, you. i'm good. fine thank you yeah waking up this morning very earlier uh, is this your normal time my normal time really yeah Okay, good, good. All right, let's just go to, of course, we ran that clip and uh, you see what is really emerging as far as resources is concerned. People are discovering, yes, we have oil and uh, there's issue of land right now. Uh, people are feeling, you know, a bit threatened by bugbears and fears about uh, their property. Will Is it now a property of the government or is it for the community? And there is this, you know, tug of war that is ongoing not only in Kajado, also in Turukana, they're saying, you know, we need to employ our own people. Why do you bring foreigners? That is also happening in Kisumu as well. Yeah. So I think it's a doji ground. We don't want the resource caste syndrome to actually be attendant with the oil discovery in Kenya. Right. Tell us more about what you think of that particular story from Kajado especially. Well, you know, I think the... Um a lot of the, as you said, the clip that you ran from uh, from uh, Kajado, yes, and the news that was out about Kasumu and the stories we've heard about Turkana, 
Um, it, I think that from from our standpoint at at KK, it's all about local content. And you know, I think that as we're going to talk about it, there's national content where it's, or actually there's regional content. East Africans uh, need to be involved in this industry. Then there's national content where Kenyans need to be involved. And then there's local content where where Kenyans from a particular place mm -hmm. need to be involved. And then there's community content. Yes. And then there's village content. And the investors that are coming to, to Kenya mm -hmm. for oil and gas exploration and mining, um, I think that our advice is that they think local content, national content first. How will they engage with the, the local community? Because uh, if you, when you engage, the mystery goes away. Mm -hmm. And when the mystery goes away, people feel comfortable. When they feel comfortable, uh, the investor is more comfortable to, ev to source labor, uh, products, uh, the whole supply chain. You know, up in Turkana, it's been a, a real revelation um, and a real transition where when I think the a lot of these companies, when they first came, mm -hmm. they hooked up with some local uh, people and they started to do their business, but they hadn't looked widely at supply chains. Now up in Turkana, mm -hmm. vehicles that are, uh, are sourced uh, by, the, by the contractors and by the oil companies, mm -hmm. they're provided by Turkana companies. Food, food stuffs, a lot of things in the supply chain, water, gas, scratch cards, all those things now, there are businesses that have been established in Turkana and that's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. So I don't think people should be afraid and I think the, the, when, when a, a group gets together and says, you know, we're afraid we're gonna lose our land, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not really that way. It's okay, you may be like, if you're gonna plant some maize, you're gonna use your land for something to generate economic growth. Yes. Well, it's the same thing. You're using the land to, and they'll work these things out. There'll be leases, there'll be some people will loan their land, some people will sell their land, but it'll be, it'll be okay. It's not something we should fear. It's something, as you said, needs to be managed properly. Yeah, but we don't have uh, much assurance from the government because most people, they have uh, the feeling that, you know, if the government comes and take over, uh, we won't have that trickling effect going back to the per collecting down to the community. Well, I think that's also, I mean, timing is everything. Here we are, we're devolving our government. The counties are feeling more, uh, you know, uh, responsibility and authority for managing their own destinies. So I don't think people should be afraid of that because I know that their production sharing agreements and their royalty and their revenue uh, sharing agreements that are being discussed now mm -hmm. and that are being finalized by the government in partnership with the industry and in partnership with organizations that are considering the social impact of what happens when mm. this area ends up with this kind of money, how will they manage it? There are many people, uh, consultants from around the world who are in Kenya now looking at the whole picture. So the, the concept of how the revenue will percolate down to the local community, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's formula based and mm -hmm. it, it can be negotiated and it can be discussed. So really part of my stump here mm. is to make sure that this doesn't scare anybody. This is great news for us. This oil and gas uh, industry, the mining industry, the extractive in, uh, extractives industries, it's wonderful. And as you mentioned earlier, there are other parts of Africa where they've found oil or they've found diamonds or they've found something and it's created you know, havoc in the economy, socially, economically. But in Kenya, believe me, I, I, I spent a lot of time with the people who were managing this, and it's being managed. Mm -hmm. The stories, uh, the balance from the media and the stories uh, where people are mm -hmm. generating issues and concerns should be balanced by the fact that the government, uh, the cabinet secretaries, and a lot of the government officials that are involved, they're on this. Mm -hmm. The president himself and the deputy president, they know the value of, of this industry. So I think that people should be comfortable that there's a process and they just need to engage. The investors need to engage with the community and the community has to engage with the investors. And, and, and the community also, they have to be amazingly patient because they think you know, <coughs> we want some immediate yeah. benefits from this. That, talk to me about the question of the short-term and uh, mid-term uh, projections yeah, of oil discoveries. And of course, also the implication of geostrategic implications that comes with it. Well, I mean, I, 
I don't have I'm not I don't have access to the confidential information that the oil companies have, but I've seen like you. I mean, every once in a while you see a, the term somebody found a billion barrels. They yes. found a billion barrels in Turkana. They found two billion barrels here. They found a billion barrels in Mandera or Wajir or someplace. These estimates that are there, it's a very intricate part of, and you've seen the government partner with the investors now where they want to make these announcements jointly. Mm. Because these announcements are, obviously, if you're in business, you're trying to attract investors. And the more your investors believe that you are able to find the oil and find the gas, the easier you're uh, you know, generating the capital. But I think the announcements um, and the estimates are that there are, <laughs> that there's a lot of oil mm -hmm. uh, in the Turkana Basin and around, uh, around the East African um, uh, community. You know the coast now. There are some hydrocarbons. You know, uh, there, there are companies well. that have been offshore in Malindi and offshore in um, Mombasa and onshore in Turkana and Kasumu and Narak and other places. So there, this is going to be big. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's uh, it's hard to even imagine. I think from Ke in the Kenyan context, uh, with tourism and horticulture and all these other things that we that are basic parts of our economy, this oil and gas. It's going to be big, and it's going to be big for 50 years. All right. Do you think that we have the, the proper institutional framework, uh, the regulatory framework as well, and sound policies to try and govern the oil and gas sector right now in the country? Well, I wouldn't, uh, I mean, if I say no to that, yes. uh, it, I don't want it to be seen as negative. I mean, we're all kind of new at this. So Maybe uh, adequate. <laughs> yeah, no, it's adequate for now. Yes. And the good thing is that there are a lot of very smart people working on it. Um, there are consultants and organizations, um, you know, guys like Patrick Obath, who's a, a Kenyan with a wealth of knowledge in, in this industry. He and other key players are working on how, on the plan, because it's not just about, again, I, the people make the, the analogy between coffee and oil and gas. Mm -hmm. In coffee, we, get, we were great at coffee. We put the beans in a bag and we send them somewhere else and other people do the value addition. In oil and gas, you know, whether you extract oil or extract gas, there are so many downstream uh, benefits from uh, oil production and oil refining. You know, we need fertilizer, mm -hmm. plastics. You know, you just need to look at what they did in Texas in America, where they found oil, and now they're a lot of, I, I would guess that uh, the majority of their revenue comes from the downstream byproducts. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it from a holistic standpoint, yes. Um, it's great, but your, your question about are the policies and the infrastructure, I mean, we need a pipeline, mm -hmm. so, and they're starting the pipeline. We need a refinery, and they're working on a refinery. We need to work with our neighbors in Uganda and Rwanda and Burundi and the DRC, and the East African community is looking at how to do that. The Lapsit pipeline to Lamu, the infrastructure. So I think the thing that people need to understand is this isn't, we're not going to be selling our first barrel of oil next week, to your point about the expectations of the community. Mm -hmm. They say the guy's coming, oil and gas is here, you know, by September we're going to be, you know, exporting oil from this place or the other place. And it's not like that. I think the industry believes that 2017, 2017, 2018 is when we'll be doing the production, the production, uh, the productionizing of the, of the, of the, the petroleum products, the transmission through pipelines, and then marketing. But we hope a lot of us hope that we'll also develop the downstream um, capabilities as well so that we don't just export the oil and gas mm -hmm. and then buy it back from somebody uh, as, 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 as diesel or petroleum. Right, and that has been the case, you know, people also are wondering, yes, uh, yes, these are natural resources and it should be for the public uh, good of, you know, it should be the public uh, benefits to actually accrue, you know, uh, goodies from the oil discovery. But they don't want it to be an item, you know, being used by, you know, or the contingent of the government's dis discretion. Well, yeah, I suppose that... I, that I, is I where we're having that. a tripping wire, isn't it? Well, it's one of the, it's one of the, it's one of the areas where there can be controversy and, and discussions. But I want to take you back away from that tripwires and, and, <laughs> and community uprisings and things like that. And, and I ask people, because, you know, what we're doing, for example, uh, with the KK Training Institute, just for, as an example, yes. 
we have uh, our board at KK and the uh, and the directors of the company have decided that they want to have a three, four, or five year vision mm -hmm. on how to prepare East Africans, Kenyans mainly, for this industry. So instead of talking about uh, you know are we ready? Do we have the right policies? I know that those things are being worked on, but the most important aspect of this industry is to prepare people to take these jobs because currently. I would guess maybe 85, 90 percent of the people who are here working on this business in this industry are expatriates. Whether they're that's the thing for, for whether they're from Egypt or Eastern Europe or Philippines or, or or Malaysia, these are the people that know the oil and gas business, the operations side of it from around the world. So of course they have to come, and the local content requirements that are in the production sharing agreements that can range from. You know, we want them to be 50% local content, 60% local content, 70. It doesn't really matter what the percentage is because we don't have the people available for these investors to hire. And that's the work that we're doing to train drillers and welders and mechanical uh, specialists mm -hmm. and pipe fitters, roughnecks, roustabouts, floormen, all these jobs that you need to, to drill and to produce these um, hydrocarbons. We have about two, two, three years, and so that's why we're encouraging um, those who haven't decided on their career path yet, or those who have decided on a career path and can't find the job they want, to come to KK and say, look, you know, I'm interested. Can I take an introductory health and safety class? Can I take an introductory drilling class? Can I take an introductory class on, on, on hydrocarbon engineering and things like that in partnership with some of the universities? So that's what we're doing. That's the message we're trying to get out, is to start now, get your prerequisites, go to these companies and apply for these jobs, get in the industry, and then the, the, the tripwires, the downside, the things that happen <clears throat> will become less and less because Kenyans will be engaged in this industry. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was so, <coughs> you're one of the leading company that is, you know, exploring uh, the Kenyan coast, trying to see if we have so much hydrocarbons is tallow oil and of, they were actually advertising looking for Kenyans who are interested so that they can take them also to be trained in the UK so in the country right now this has come maybe from the left side we are caught unprepared we don't have the expertise <coughs> to try and fill in the gap is and that's where okay, actually I, KK I, is again, really I'm coming not in handy. Sure we were caught unprepared I think people uh, initially when an industry comes to a, a country like Kenya yes uh, it's not. It's not. Uh, it's not really fair to assume that everybody's going to be there to, to to provide the skills and the, and do the work that needs to be done. So I don't think we're caught by surprise. I think that again, there are companies who have decided to invest now. We would be caught by surprise if we waited much longer. Mm -hmm. But I think the government is interested in engaging now. The new investors that are coming, the ones that are now just coming now to do their seismics and their early exploration. Now they have uh, some, of, there are at least a few Kenyans who have been trained where they can, you know, uh, the training that we provide is globally certified and accredited so that, you know, organizations like OPEDO and IOSH mm -hmm. and other organizations mm -hmm. that are recognized around the world for oil and gas, yes. you show up with a certificate with that brand on it and the oil company says, okay, yeah, that's great, come. And then after that, the other dynamic I think Kenyans need to appreciate is once you get in these companies, a lot of these companies then they fund and pay for the training that you need to develop your career. So you just need to get in and fund uh, with you know 20, 25k to get into a introductory oil and gas class that we can do online or face to face. And then after that, you can pound the pavement, get yourself a job, and hook up to the in the industry, and you'll probably be trained um, right up until you uh, you know you develop your career. So that's the vision people should have about the the human element of this thing. I, I, I agree with you that we need to continue to focus on the infrastructure, we need to control, uh, focus on policy, mm -hmm. production sharing, revenue sharing, community liaison, mm -hmm. and all those aspects. But together, if it's managed properly, right. it's going to oh, be big time. Now we have this sudden flash of interest uh, on Africa because of course now we're discovering so much an expanse uh, uh, layout of hydrocarbons in Africa. And of course, the Middle East, with its time oil now, there's so much instability, and so the countries that are interested of, uh, in, in oil, they're now training their focus on Africa to develop uh, Africa, which also China is, is one of them. 
my question to you is uh, do you think then we have the attendant infrastructure of course, we have the, uh, the railway gauge saga that is happening in this country. And we can hack back also into the history of America when, through the industrialization, uh, starting with uh, the railway infrastructure that was, mm. you know, spurred by Cornelius uh, Vanderbilt. And then you see what ca came in next was the discovery of oil with uh, John D. Rockefeller. And that was something that dramatically changed America as well because there was infrastructure, right? So they came in they just dovetailed together we have the the logic discovery of oil in cleveland and there's a distribution network everywhere and they're using the proper infrastructure of railway that was laid before mm. here in the country we have that particular discovery right now do you think as far as infrastructure is concerned then it might be a bit of a challenge it's a huge challenge and i in my earlier comments i don't want to downplay the importance of infrastructure. I mean, for example, the oil that they found in Lake Albert and Lake Edward in Uganda, it's there, mm -hmm. but they don't. Um, it's very waxy. It's a. It's a very. Uh, it's a. It's a much more difficult uh, uh, grade of oil to just throw into a pipeline and send somewhere. So they they found the oil, but they, the infrastructure to move it mm -hmm. and to refine it isn't there yet. They're working on it. So I think no. We, I think the government. Uh, I think the the investors. I think that when you talk to a, a company like Total, or you talk to a company like Chevron or Shell, these global giants mm -hmm. in the industry, mm -hmm. they are they only these days they'll only go and invest where they see some infrastructure. They can't afford to go and invest and wait for the government to do something. So that's why this Lapsit pipeline and to start it. And to get it going, it's it's very important. And and you saw, I think, yesterday in the newspaper, the PS, in PS Jorgi was talking about the need to make sure we have storage facilities. And then there's the controversy about our our refinery down in Mombasa and what we're going to do with that with that resource. So all of these things have to be put in place because you, once you find the oil or the gas, you have to be able to do something with it and move it. And we're not prepared for that yet. But as I said, I think we have a couple of years before. We're going to be. We're going to require um, a pipeline to be able to move finished products, but we have production facilities. We have de-waxing facilities. We have other uh, uh, activities and things that we can be working on now. And I believe the government is. I think that um, they've 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 put the team together for Lapsit. I think the contract is supposed to come out in the next this week or next week, and the general contractors will be. But the point will be, <clears throat> when they get it, they're going to need a thousand welders. Mm -hmm. They're going to need a thousand pipe fitters. They're going to need a thousand security officers to, to get it going. And our job is to try, and the reason that we're involved in this business at KK is just to make sure that when that come, that time comes, I'm sure the first welders that come for Lapsit will be expatriates. And I don't think we should say that we missed the boat or it blindsided us or surprised us. We've, we've known it, but sometimes it takes a while to get these things going. So I would guess that we're a little bit behind the curve. We could have been a year or two into this by now, but we're. St I think we should be optimistic that it's going to be done in time to 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 generate uh, employment and opportunities for, for Kenyans. All right, and that is really also changing dramatically the mindsets of Kenya as far as the mainstream careers is concerned. Uh, it's a new frontier with the discovery of oil and gas in this country. Maybe you can just remind us on what courses at KK that you're offering right now as far as this uh, frontier is, is concerned. With the foremen, welders, at, uh, the uh, rafters, you, that you, rafter busters, as you call them. Yeah. Yes, that you will be also training as well. The, the rigging experts and stuff like that. Okay, uh, so, so yes. what, <coughs> what we've done is, what, is I've tried to lay out the, lo lay out the logic. Yes. You, you need to take prerequisites. The most important thing in the, in the oil and gas and extractives industry is environment, health, and safety because it's inherently a, a potentially dangerous industry. So everybody needs basic health and safety. Uh, how do you, uh, what happens if you smell hydrogen sulfide gas? Um, how to work in confined spaces? How to work uh, at heights? Um, how to, we're, we're bringing a drilling rig from, um, from a, a retired drilling rig from Canada, and we're going to set it up in a training center that we're going to do just outside of Nairobi. We have, an, we have two uh, locations that we're trying to choose from. 
But once we get it done, we're going to actually have a drilling rig where people can be trained on an actual rig here in Kenya. And then we're going to have a welding uh, institute where we're going to be uh, training. You know, welding is when you have someone make the gate for your windows in your house, it's one thing. But when you're welding <laughs> for oil and gas yes. around all this stuff, it's a it's, huge yeah. difference. And it can take up to six months for a welder to be certified to be able to work in an oil and gas um, facility. So. So again, we're, uh, we're, we have all the introductory classes. We have them online. We have them face-to-face -to -face called Rig Pass. In fact, today I'm going from here to a, a, court, a class that we're having with uh, 20 students that are uh, taking Rig Pass, which is a face-to-face -face oil and gas health and safety course. We have a IMIST, which is a, 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 a new course that's global, based on global standards. It's online. It can be done at our Invigilation Center in Westlands or in Dar es Salaam or in Kampala. So those are the things that people should focus on now to get the, the prerequisites. But once they decide that they want to be a welder or a pipe fitter or an electrician or they want to be a driller, then we have classes that are uh, available and that will be available in the next few months mm -hmm. to take up to 100 Kenyans a week. Mm -hmm. uh, to fill, to start to develop a, uh, a labor pool for this industry. All right, as we're winding up then, uh, there's the issue of, you know, as you're saying, having proper trained welders. And what about non-destructive uh, testing experts in this country? Because I think when we have those storages, the huge tanks, uh, the risk of leakages, Bound. And we, we, when we have these experts in the country, because we know we are running short of also of non-destructive uh, testing experts in this country. Okay. Well, uh, I, mentioned, also I mentioned the three things that are important are environment, health, and safety. And safety. Believe me, these uh, these companies that are coming to invest in Kenya, and the co <clears throat> the contractors that work for them. There's almost no, um, I mean, NEMA and in, in America, the EPA, and here locally, the Environmental Management uh, Agency, these guys have very strict rules and regulations, and they're being enforced. I mean, you want to do an oil storage facility, it's not going to be just like putting a tank up in some place and hoping that things work out well. All the infrastructure, all the planning, all the, I mean, oil companies, oil and gas companies or extractor companies, the one thing that they fear, or they fear a few things, but, you know, they don't want anything to blow up, uh, they don't want anything to burn down, and they sure don't want anything to leak because the environmental impact of what they do, right from the very beginning when they're doing their seismic, when they're, you know, exploding, uh, making explosions, and then listening to the echo to decide if there's oil or gas down below, when, if you go and follow them around, like in Kasumu, where they're doing the seismics now, when, when they're done, you can't tell they were there. They replace the rocks, they replace all the, and so there's a real focus on environmental um, uh, preservation and avoiding, but I would take your point that we all need, also need to be prepared, uh, you know, like, we're, like we need to be prepared for fire, uh, just normal fire uh, uh, disasters that happen and other disasters that could end up environmental. We need to be prepared to deal with those, but let me tell you, the planning process doesn't leave a lot of room for, for so there's, there are very tight regulations, and people should feel comfortable that if they get an oil rig <coughs> coming to their neighborhood, that they're not gonna, that their land's not gonna be spoiled. It's gonna, they're gonna do their work in a way where it's preserved. And that's another one of the policy issues that the Kenyan government's taken very seriously. All right, brief, yeah. briefly your, your headline thoughts yeah. as, okay. you're, as you're winding up. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I, no, my, I have only one message, and that's that this industry is going to need 20,000 Kenyans in the next three years. You should decide how you want to play. Come to KK, sign up for some basic training, see if it's what you want to do. And if it's not what you want to do, maybe it's what your brother wants to do or your sister wants to do. Because if we don't act now, Surely you'll be doing a story in a year from now saying we missed the boat. All right, true. And we, and we don't want to miss the boat. We don't want to miss the boat. No. Right. And of course, I don't want to miss the boat, of course, on a very vital issue that we've not discussed off the rails regarding the polygamy uh, uh, bill that we saw, the marriage bill that was passed yesterday. I saw your wife also <coughs> was in uh, Parliament yesterday also sharing and making her views uh, uh, regarding that particular a bill itself. I don't know what are your thoughts about this. So, are you gagging for another one as you're winding up? <laughs> <laughs>
Um, <laughs> oh, look, you know, I'm, I'm an American, a uh -huh. Kenyan of American origin. And uh, I would, uh, my, you know, my personal feeling is I was a bit disappointed in the results of the discussion yesterday. But I understand that, um, I understand that in the African culture, <clears throat> that maybe men are a bit apprehensive to open up their, <clears throat> open themselves up, liberalize their relationships like the rest of the world has. And so I would guess we're maybe a little bit behind the curve on that. I'm very much for um, the respect of women and involving them in what you do. I mean, um, my wife's a women's representative and and it's not because of that, but I'm, I consider myself a, a modern uh, I'm a, a modern man. I heard Sheila talking about one of the topics she's talking about today is what is a man? Well, I think a man is a, someone who can accept a woman. And uh, uh, so that's my, my position is that I think that you need one of each. Fantastic. Yeah. Good point to end uh, this particular conversation. I really do appreciate it. Okay. Well, right. thanks for having me. You're welcome. All right. We've been speaking to the director Oil and Gas KK Training Institute, Bill Lay, telling us more about the oil discovery in this country and how we can try and avoid the the resource, you know, crisis that we normally have, the resource caste syndrome that comes with oil discovery and other resources in various parts of this world. Thank you very much for your valid company. Don't go away. Much more coming up on the other side of the break.